In our last lecture, we looked at two competing views of how to account for the assemblage of species or the community that we might find in a particular ecosystem. We saw how patterns of ecological succession leading to apparently similar climax communities suggested the view put forth by Frederick Clements that species found in an area are highly predictable because, of cert because only certain combinations of species interact with each other in the integrated way necessary to support the function of that community as a whole. We also saw, however, that long-term historical analyses of changes in species distribution, as well as experimental tests, really demonstrate that the particular species we find in an area are relatively unpredictable, supporting the contrasting view of Henry Gleason that species should be seen as more individualistic entities. Now today, we're going to pick up on this idea of the role of history and chance in determining the distribution of species. But we're going to shift our attention to a larger scale, asking how contingencies associated with um, uh, longer term history and chance events can help explain patterns of the distribution of species on a large regional scale or even on a global scale. Biogeography is the name given to the branch of biology that attempts to account for patterns of the distribution of populations, of species, and of ecological communities on a global scale, and biogeography will be the subject of today's lecture. As the name suggests, biogeography combines information about biology with information about geography in order to, in order to explain these large-scale patterns. Patterns such as why certain kinds of organisms or certain numbers of kinds of organisms are found where they are. Now, biogeography is a very broad and integrative discipline. It has to be because of the kinds of information it's integrating. We can separate it conveniently for the sake of argument into two main sub-disciplines. Historical biogeography takes a long-term, really an evolutionary perspective to the question of why certain kinds of species are found where they are, across broad areas. Ecological biogeography focuses on shorter-term ecological processes, such as patterns of dispersal and colonization and extinction, in an effort to explain why different numbers of species are found in different regions. Actually, these names are a little bit misleading. All biogeography really incorporates information about history in the sense that it looks at changes in patterns of species distributions over time. The distinction is that what we call historical biogeography more formally really concentrates on effects over very long geological periods of time, um, whereas ecological biogeography really focuses on a time scale at which individual life histories and ecological interactions seem to matter the most. Now we're going to begin today's lecture by considering how we can learn something from, uh, about the distribution of species from historical biogeographic analysis. And then after we've just looked at a couple of examples of that, we'll turn our attention to an example of how ecological biogeography can help explain something about the abundance of species in a region. Well, to begin our discussion of historical bio biogeography, I want you to consider kind of a puzzling distribution of a particular species. Now, the species I'm going to describe for you is called uh, Liparobius huttoni, and it's a, it's a kind of beetle called a weevil, okay? Now, weevils in general are a kind of beetle. Most beetles can fly, but this particular weevil, Liparobius huttoni, is flightless, right? It cannot fly. Now, this beetle has an interesting distribution. It's, a, it, it's found in New Zealand. And you, you may not know this unless you've looked at a map recently, but New Zealand is actually divided into two large islands, the so-called North Island and the South Island. Now, this particular weevil is found both on the North Island and on the South Island. It's found in the mountains in the northern region of the South Island, and it's found in mountainous cliffs that are right at the southern part of the North Island. Now, separating these two islands is about a 25-mile wide body of water called Cook Strait. Now, these two species are identical species. They're flightless. So we're left with kind of an interesting question. How is it that we've got these two, this one species occurring on one island and the other when they're separated by such a vast gulf that they don't seem to be able to traverse? Well, there are a couple of ways that you could imagine that you would get this kind of disjunct distribution. Maybe what happened is that this weevil actually, you know, evolved or was occurring on one island, let's say the South Island, where its population size is really larger, but some individuals somehow colonized the North Island. This could happen. 
It seems unlikely because this is a flightless weevil. How does it get across the Cook Strait? But there are cases where, where organisms are known to have caught a piece of floating vegetation blown across in a storm or something like that. This is called rafting, and maybe, maybe some of these weevils rafted across to the North Island. On the other hand, this all seems particularly unlikely when you look at the community in which this weevil is found. Because the community in which it's found actually has a large number of plant and animal species, about 60 plant and animal species, that share the same disjunct distribution. This community is found both in the South Island and in the North Island. How is it that the same community, 60 or more species, all could have this disjunct distribution? It doesn't seem at all likely that they all could have caught the same raft in the same storm and made it across. Well now, an alternative explanation for this particularly interesting disjunct distribution comes from considering the historical geography of New Zealand. It turns out that about five million years ago, during what we call the Pliocene era, the present-day southwest corner of what is now the North Island of New Zealand actually was physically connected to the South Island. There was a barrier of water between two large islands, but it occurred far north of where the current Cook Strait is located. Now, if you go back and you look at the geography of New Zealand five million years ago during the Pliocene, the distribution of Lyperobius and these other species makes perfect sense. This was all one continuous community. But geograph or geological processes changed the relative um, uh, elevations of parts of these islands. What happened was Cook Strait appeared separating these community, this community, and now in modern day uh, geography we have this disjunct distribution. We call these kinds of changes, by the way, um, vicariance events. Remember we talked about vicariance actually in the very first third of the course when we were talking about evolutionary mechanisms, when we talked about allopatric speciation and how barriers might arise between populations and if the barriers lasted long enough then these populations might diverge. In this particular case we have an example of a vicariance distribution that hasn't led to speciation, may never lead to speciation, but certainly accounts for this interesting distribution. So we've seen something then about how we can explain the distribution of a species not in terms of anything having to do with abundance or resources of, of um, uh, abundance of resources or energy and not in a particularly a, uh, a predictable way but instead, instead just by going back and looking at something about the history of the region. Well, let me give you another example about how historical analysis can tell you something about um, not only the distribution of species, but maybe even about their evolutionary patterns. Now, this example involves five very closely related species of birds. These are warblers. We've talked about warblers a couple of times in this course up to this point. This W group of warblers is actually very closely related. It's called the black-throated green warbler complex. And it's called the black-throated green warbler complex because the, most, uh, the, the species having the broadest distribution is the black-throated green. And the black-throated green has a broad distribution that extends from the northeastern United States up through central Canada. Now, the other four species in this complex are the Townsend's warbler and the hermit warbler and the black-throated gray warbler and the golden cheek warbler. These species all have relatively non-overlapping, largely non-overlapping distributions out in the western part of the continental United States. Now, here's the question. Why do we have these five species occurring where they are, especially with one very broadly distributed species, the black-throated green warbler in the eastern part of the United States, and these four very closely related species uh, with more separated distributions out in the western part of the United States? Well, one possible answer to this question, again, comes from going back and looking at geological history. And specifically, looking, considering the hypothesis that the distribution, the present day distribution of these species has something to do with the periodic advance and retreat of glaciers in the continental United States um, about two million years ago or so, or a little less, during what we call the Pleistocene era. 
Now, the distribution of these five species is consistent with the hypothesis that one broadly distributed species, the ancestor of the black-throated green warbler, had its population's distribution separated periodically, divided periodically, by a vicarious event, in this case the advance of a glacier, which would essentially separate off some smaller population in the western part of the continent from the, from the remainder of the population in the eastern part of the continent. And what we could imagine is that as glaciers advanced and retreated over geological time, these different populations would be butted off in the West. And so over a period of some years, of some millions of years, we would end up with a number of these very close related but genetically distinct populations in the West coming from what essentially was an ancestor source population that's repeatedly subdivided in the east, the black-throated greens ancestor. Well, is this a valid hypothesis? Now, there are a variety of ways to test this, but one of the things we need to do is to look at the evolutionary relationships among these species of birds and ask, does the branching pattern of these species as we can infer from molecular genetic analyses of their relatedness, correspond to the historical pattern of the advance and retreat of glaciers. And the answer is, when we look at this, is sort of mixed. If you just look at the, at the evolutionary relationships among some of these warblers, these data are still being obtained, and so the picture is changing, but if you just look at some of them, you de do see some partial support for this hypothesis. Specifically, you see that a couple of lineages have, from an evolutionary point of view, butted off from the ancestral lineage leading to the black-throated green warbler. The black-throated gray warbler was the first species to diverge, and then at some later point in time, there is an uh, evolutionary lineage that leads both to the hermit warbler and the Townsend's warbler. Now, what we're, ex what we're hypothesizing is that the occurrence of these sp uh, splits of lineages corresponds with a vicariant separation of the ancestral populations by the advance of a glacier. If you look at this hypothesis in a little more detail, some of the evidence doesn't necessarily support it in all of its, um, in, in all of its details. First of all, some aspects of um, this uh, evolutionary history just doesn't fit the hypothesis. So, as I said, both the Hermits and the Townsend's ancestral species butted off together. The evolutionary divergence of these two species occurs after their common ancestor butted off from the ancestor of the black-throated green warbler. And furthermore, if you look at the geographic distribution of these two species, the Hermits and the Townsend's, it doesn't fit the hypothesis very well either because these two species are separated in a north-south distribution that suggests that their divergence, at least, must be due to some other factors in evolutionary history. So not all of these five species can be accounted for simply by just uh, the hypothesis that glaciation separated ancestral populations. Actually, potentially even more troubling for this hypothesis are analyses that attempt to date using molecular genetic uh, means the timing of the divergence of, of when those divergences actually occurred. So, for example, when in geological time did the ancestor of the black-throated gray warbler butt off from the ancestral line uh, for the whole clade? The hypothesis suggests that that has to have happened at some period of time uh, after a glaciation event occurred. And similarly, the lineage leading to the Hermits and the Townsends has to have butted off after a glaciation event had occurred, because our hypothesis is that it's the glaciation event which is responsible for separating these species. While the timing of glaciation events is pretty easy to establish using geological techniques, methods for um, uh, estimating the timing of evolutionary divergences have a number of assumptions that are sometimes hard to test, but the best evidence to date suggests that at least some of the branching that we see in this lineage of warblers doesn't actually fit very well the timing of when glaciation events occurred. Now, I have to point out that this is a bit controversial for the following reason.
It's hard to actually date the timing of divergence of species because what we're really doing when we do that sort of thing is looking at how similar a couple of genes are, maybe just a small suite of genes. We're asking how similar they are in terms of the number of mutations that they do and don't share in common. And the idea is that we can use something called the molecular clock technique to date how, uh, uh, how uh, far back in time lineages split by the number of, of mutations they do and don't share in common. The difficulty is, is that we can't really describe the splitting of a lineage in terms of just divergence of one gene, or even a couple of genes. What you really need to do is, is take a statistical estimate of a whole bunch of genes, and this is hard to do. People are doing this now, and we'll see if this hypothesis does or doesn't gain more support in the future. But even if the hypothesis isn't quite right, it still makes the general point of how we can use information about geological history to explain patterns of pre uh, present-day distributions of species. Okay, let's turn now to what we've referred to as ecological biogeography. As I said earlier, ecological biogeography concerns itself with theories that explain the numbers of kinds of organisms that occur in different communities. Ecological biogeography actually is also something that's uh, amenable to experimental tests of hypotheses, which are always very satisfying for an ecologist. Tests that are not possible when we're doing uh, kind of historical biogeographic analyses. So for the remainder of this lecture, what I want to do is to focus on just one particularly central question to ecologists, which is what determines the number of species, or what we would call the species richness, um, in a particular region or a particular area. And I want to focus on this um, particular question, not only because it's an important one, but because, because it's also a question for which a particularly useful model has been developed. Now, let's think about the problem in general terms. We're asking how many species do we find in, area, in an area. Now, if we step back and think of this in relatively simplistic terms, there's really only two factors that could account for this in ecological time, right? The first factor is the number of species that arrive at that area, the number of species who come in and colonize that area, or what we would call the number of immigrant species in an area. Right? Those are going to be added to this area. The second factor is the number of species that go extinct locally during some period of time in that, area, uh, in, in that area. So we have species being added through immigration and species being taken out through extinction. So the question is, how might biogeographers use information about immigration and extinction to predict or to account for the species richness or number of species in a region? Now this problem was first addressed um, in a formal model in the 1960s by Robert MacArthur He's an ecologist we've run into before. He's the person who did that work on niche separation in warblers. Um, and also E.O. Wilson, who is a very well-known ecologist at Harvard University. Now, MacArthur and Wilson modeled the effects of extinction and immigration by considering species richness on oceanic islands. Now, the advantage of looking at islands is simply that they provide sort of well-defined geographic regions whose species richness can be easily quantified. You can say, here's the island, here's the boundary, let's go and ask how many species of particular kind of organism are found there. The kinds of organisms that MacArthur and Wilson were working on were bird species because they're easy to sample, they're easy to assay. There aren't so many species, you can't count them all. You can find them and you can say, this is the species richness of bird on this island. Now, MacArthur and Wilson actually were specifically interested in two patterns that had been observed before and that they also documented on these ocean oceanic islands. The first pattern they saw was that the richness of species, species richness on an island, corresponded to its size. Larger islands had more species than smaller islands. Now, the second pattern that they uh, saw was that the species richness of an island depended on how far away that island was from some mainland. If you factored out size, or if you just considered islands of all the same size, those islands that were closer to some mainland had more species on them than islands that were farther away. This was a very consistent pattern. Uh, MacArthur and Wilson documented it with islands in the South Pacific, and a number of people have looked at it in other kinds of islands in other parts of the world. So, MacArthur and Wilson wanted to develop a biogeographic model that could account for these two patterns, that smaller islands had fewer species than larger islands, and that more remote islands had fewer species than islands nearer mainland.
Because they developed their model to ori originally to account for species richness on islands, this model has now become known as the theory of island biogeography. But it's really a general model for accounting for species richness. How this works is um, the following. Consider a, um, a newly formed oceanic island, now, one that has no species at all. And in fact, these kinds of islands do occur. We talked about this as an example of primary succession. But let's just imagine that we have an island, there's no species on it, and we want to ask how do species get there? Well, the species that are going to arrive there are going to arrive there by dispersal, of course. These are going to be the, the immigrant species. Where are these species coming from? They're coming from what MacArthur and Wilson called the species pool of whatever the closest mainland is. Occasionally some species is going to disperse away and it might find that island or not, but where that species is coming from is some mainland, and they said there's a total number of species on that mainland that could possibly get here, and that total number we're going to call the species pool. Now, the first colonists to arrive on an island are obviously all new species to that island because it starts out with no species at all, right? But as the number of species on an island continues to increase, the rate of colonization is going to have to decline. This is because more and more of the individuals that happen to disperse to this island through chance are going to be species that are already found on the island. Remember, the species pool is finite. When the first species arrive, they're all going to be new. But eventually, as new species disperse into the island, they may actually be the same species that already is there. So as more species arrive at an island, the rate of immigration is going to have to go down. Now, let's consider extinction rates on the island. All right? Now, as the number of species on that island increases, the extinction rate of species on that island should also decrease or increase for two reasons. The first reason has to do with available resources. If there are only a few species on the island, then they're going to be able to divide those resources on the island more broadly. And we see this time and time again. The fewer species, the broader the niches those species occupy, and the larger the populations of those species. If there are more species per unit area, they will partition their niches more finely, and they will necessarily have smaller populations. Smaller populations are more prone to go extinct than larger populations. So by definition, the more, po the more kinds of species you have on an island, the more likely any one of those species is going to go extinct because their population sizes will be smaller on average. Now there's a second reason that the extinction rate on an island will go up as the number of species on that island increases, and that's simply because there's more species to go extinct the joint probability of any species going extinct at any one time is going to increase as there are more species that could possibly go extinct. Now, because the rate of arrival of new species decreases and the extinction rate increases as the number of species on an island increase, eventually the number of species present on any island should reach an equilibrium, which reflects a balance between these two contrasting trends. This equilibrium will occur at an intersection of the two curves that we could draw to describe immigration rate and extinction rate as a function of the number of species on the island. Now, given this framework, why should the number of species on an island vary with the size of the island, and why should the number of species on the island vary with the distance of that island to its mainland? The answer to that question in general must have something to do with how size and distance from the mainland affects immigration and extinction rates, because it's these immigration and extinction rates that are going to determine the intersection, which is the equilibrium number of species. MacArthur and Wilson reasoned that the size of an island influences both immigration and extinction rates in the following ways. As I said, smaller islands will have higher extinction rates for the same number of species because being smaller, there are fewer resources to divide up among those species. So for any given number of species, a smaller island will have a higher extinction rate. Smaller islands also may have lower immigration rates because being smaller, colonizers are less likely to find them. I mean, it's literally a matter of chance that a colonizer will find an island. The smaller the island is, the lower the probability that some colonizer will stumble upon it. Thus, the smaller the island, the fewer species will be found at it in its equilibrium because we have both lower immigration rates and higher extinction rates shifting that equilibrium number, the intersection between those two functions, to a lower number. 
Now, MacArthur and Wilson then, after they said they could explain how size of the island affects number of species at equilibrium, argued that the distance of an island from the mainland, remember the mainland is the source of the species pool, um, affected immigration rates in specific, and it did so in the following way. The farther an island is from its species source, the species pool, the harder it is for species to disperse to that island, again as a matter of chance. Imagine two islands, one that's close to a mainland and one that's farther away. And now imagine that you are just on that uh, mainland and essentially throwing species out randomly. You're going to be more likely to hit an island that's closer to you than you are to hit an island that's farther away from you. So the effect of lowering the immigration rate curve um, also then suggests that as you have a lower immigration rate, because an island is farther away from the mainland, you'll have a lower equilibrium number of species. Now, the distance from some mainland and the size of an island actually in these terms can quite simply, I mean almost intuitively, explain why you would have different numbers of species on an island. But it's important to keep in mind that the number of species that MacArthur and Wilson predicted to find on an island was an equilibrium number, not a particular grouping of species. It was a dynamic equilibrium especially because they suggested that species would always be, be, always be uh, lost from that island through extinction and always be uh, being added to that island through immigration. Over time, you would have some constant number of species, but over time, the particular species on that island would blink in and blink out. So how can you test this theory of island biogeography? Well, the way you can do that is by experimentally setting up islands of different sizes and different distances from a mainland and asking how patterns of colonization, patterns of extinction, and patterns of ultimate species equilibrium after some period of time emerge on those islands. This, test, this kind of work has been done a number of times, but the first such experimental test was done in the 1960s by Dan Simberloff, who was a graduate student of Wilson's. Now, what Dan Simberloff did was realize that you could go down to the Florida Keys and find islands that could be experimentally manipulated this way in abundance. In the Florida Keys, there are, there are thousands of islands of different sizes and distances, all very small islands, but of different sizes and distances from the Florida mainland. Simberloff went down to this full, uh, section of the Florida Keys and he got permission to actually exterminate all of the species living on a number of islands. He did this by actually setting up tents around these islands, essentially canopies over them, and fumigating the islands. Now what Simberloff wanted to do was to cause all of the arthropods and insects on the islands to go extinct. He left the plant species there, and he was just going to see if he could model this biogeographic process that Wilson and MacArthur and Wilson had suggested by looking at the colonization patterns of arthropods and, in, and insects as they recolonized these islands. Indeed, what MacArthur, or what I should say, Simberloff found was that the pattern of re-emergence of species on these islands, and especially the pattern at which, or I should say, the levels at which species richness um, eventually were attained on these islands, did fit the model that was proposed by MacArthur and Wilson. Islands that were smaller had smaller numbers of species to begin with, and then when they were recolonized, they continued to have smaller number of species when they reached their equilibrium. Larger islands had more species to begin with and ended up at equilibrium with more species. Similarly, islands farther or nearer to the mainland had the predicted number of fewer or more species at equilibrium. Now, not all of Simberloff's islands, actually, as it turns out, came back to exactly the same number of species as he started out with. A few islands might actually come back with a number of species, a species equilibrium that was a little bit lower, or maybe even measurably lower than what he started out with. What Simberloff suggested was that historical chance similar to the kind of chance that David Jenkins saw in his work with experimental ponds that we talked about last time, played some role in overriding or changing the equilibrium number because of ecological interactions above and beyond the biogeographical processes that MacArthur and Wilson had suggested. And specifically, Simberloff suggested that if by chance some superior competitor got onto an island first as it was being recolonized, then that superior competitor might actually change the equilibrium set point. 
So what uh, Simberloff and others see is that you do see a predicted pattern of numbers of species in an area depending on size and distance, but this pattern can be modified But what we already know about ecological interactions, predation, and competition. Now there's one more point to be made about this theory of island biogeography, which is that all of this work was developed theoretically and initially tested experimentally in oceanic islands or islands off the coast of Florida and so forth. What's the broad applicability of this um, theory for other kinds of pieces of habitat? Well, it turns out that habitat is made up of islands of all sorts of kinds in many ways. For example, different mountaintops might be habitat islands with respect to the valleys in between them for this particular species that settle on those mountaintops. Or different ponds in an area might be island habitats for species that live in those ponds with those islands separated by the dry terrestrial areas in between them. Or in fact, different forested areas might be islands separated by grasslands, which might as well be oceans to the forest species that live within them. As it turns out, as humans increasingly fragment the habitat by cutting down forests or otherwise removing pieces of habitat from an otherwise continuous area, we're creating large numbers of islands and this theory of island biogeography may become more and more relevant to us as we try to predict what's going to happen to the number of species living in the areas that remain.